Welcome to The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. Today's episode is brought to you by The Humanist Report community. Without your guys' views, uh, which helps us generate ad revenue, without all of your kind donations, this show would not exist. On today's episode, I'm, I'm going to be discussing uh, some new Bernie Sanders bills that he introduced. Uh, I'll also be discussing yet another smear campaign launched against Bernie Sanders from none other than... You guessed it, Hillary Clinton. Uh, I'll be talking about Donald Trump as well as some Republican uh, hypocrisy in the newest segment that I'm going to be introducing, which is called The Weekly Dose, because I'm going to be giving you guys a weekly dose of stupidity because I think that we... I think it's important that we discuss the stupidity that is spread uh, due to the Republican Party uh, and other conservatives as well, and I think I need to break it down and make fun of them. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and kick off the show with that new segment. Enjoy the show. A city in Houston voted to repeal a city ordinance that protected transgender people from discrimination. Why? Well, because they're afraid of the big transgender boogeyman. You see, they think that transgender women, they don't want to use women's bathrooms just for equality. They want to go in there and they actually want to be peeping toms. So someone who wants to be a pervert, they'll get breast augmentation surgery. They will have sexual reassignment surgery. They'll change their name legally. They'll get all the legal documents changed. They'll fight for equality so that way they can win the right to use the bathroom as the gender that they identify as and after all that their maniacal scheme has finally come to fruition they can now peep on you in the bathroom and watch you take a shit they've done all that just to watch you poop what this is about is equality they don't want transgender people to have the same rights as them so they're fighting it this way so kudos to you guys because that's one of the dumbest things that happened over the week Paul Ryan, the new Speaker of the House, demanded that he has extra family leave as one of the terms to become Speaker of the House. Now, when it comes to whether or not he'll allow other Americans to take time off with their families, here's what he had to say. You said that you wouldn't take the job if it interferes with your family time, which has opened up a national conversation about the importance of spending time with your family. And there are many people in this country who would like to see you make your first priority legislation that gives people the backing of the federal government so that they can have time with their families. Would you make that one of your So I don't priorities? think people ask me to be speaker so that I can take more money from hardworking taxpayers to create some new federal entitlement. Entitlement. Where, what's his moral barometer? Where is it at? It's nowhere. No, 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 that's an entitlement. You see, I'm entitled to that, but you American plebeians aren't. I mean, you guys don't work very hard. What do you work, 50, 60 hours per week? Maybe you should work like me and then one day you can become Speaker of the House and then you can request family leave. I don't know if you've heard about me, but I'm really special. You guys aren't. So I get all that privilege. I get the entitlements, but you guys don't get anything. So this is what's going on in Paul Ryan's mind as he tries to twist himself into a pretzel to justify this hypocrisy. Freaking idiot. And hands down, the dumbest clip of the week is going to have to go to Ben Carson. Video surfaced online Wednesday of Carson giving a commencement speech in 1998. And in, in that speech, he presented his theory of why ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. My own personal theory is that Joseph built the pyramids in order to store grain. Now, all the archaeologists think that they were made for the pharaoh's graves. But, you know, it would have to be something awfully big. You stop and think about it. I don't think it would just disappear over the course of time to store that much grain. And when you look at the way the pyramids are made, with many chambers that are hermetically sealed, they would have to be that way for a reason. And, uh, you know, various scientists have said, well, you know, there were alien beings that came down and they have special knowledge and that's how they were. This, you know, it doesn't require an alien being when God is with you. Can you explain that a little bit more? What was the... Yeah, well, the pyramids were made in a way that they had hermetically sealed compartments. You wouldn't need hermetically sealed compartments uh, for a sepulcher. Mm -hmm. You would need that if you were trying to preserve grain over a long period of time. You are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Well, that was your weekly dose of stupidity. I wholeheartedly apologize to all my viewers for the IQ points you lost. Hillary Clinton has finally stated what she wants the minimum wage to be raised to, and it's not $15. She wants the wage to be raised to $12 per hour. Now, let me remind you that Hillary Clinton is someone who makes $200,000 per hour, because when she gives these speeches to Goldman Sachs, 
She's not making 12 bucks an hour. She's getting 200,000. Now, this is insufficient because this isn't a living wage. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show that to you right now. So we have this chart up here. This is MIT's living wage calculator. So as you can see here, we have a couple of different standards for what qualifies as a living wage. So a single adult wage, uh, which is just one individual, we have a single parent with one child living wage, and then we have a parent with a spouse and two children. So the living wage is progressively higher as you move from one category to the next. Now I have this map here. I don't know why I can't expand it. It's just kind of like this vertical box, but I just kind of want to illustrate to you why this is not a living wage. So if you go to right here, so the lighter colored uh, states are going to be the ones with the lower cost of living. Uh, the dark red is going to be the more higher cost of living area. So let's just go to one that's light. So right here in Grant County, Washington, a single adult would be able to survive off of Hillary Clinton's living wage because, as you see, they can survive off of $9.24. However, if you've got a kid, well, you're going to need to make at least $20, $20 in order to survive. Now, when you contrast that with a dark red county, so such as Ventura County, California, well, $12 isn't going to be enough to survive, even if you're just a single adult. If you have a kid or if you have a spouse and two children, you're going to need to make over $25 per hour in order to survive. Now, let's go to Hawaii because I have a bunch of family members in Hawaii and they always talk about how they can't survive up with the wages there. So if you are a single adult in Kauai, you need to make at least $14 per hour to survive. And if you're a parent, again, you've got to make over $25 in order to have a living wage going to the other side of the country right here in, uh, let me see if I could zoom in a little bit. Oh, shoot. Actually, let me zoom out because I want to make sure I get the calculator here too. Okay, so if we go right here to uh, Manassas City, Virginia, uh, if you're a single adult, your wage has got to be at least fourteen fifty. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to survive. So the takeaway is that Hillary Clinton's minimum wage is not a living wage, and it's not going to help. As you can see, fifteen dollars is going to be. It's not. Even, it's not going to be all of it, right? But at least fifteen dollars is the start. I mean, that's the bare minimum. I mean. At this point, we've been campaigning for $15 for a couple of years to the point where we need to start asking for $20 because by the time we actually get a raise, we're going to need a $20 living wage in order to survive in many counties uh, of, of the country. Now, let me pull up another chart for you guys because this one is also important. So when you look at how much it cost in 2014 for a two-bedroom rental, uh, well, you can see that... Uh, a $12 minimum wage will not suffice. You have to make, for example, in Oregon, $16.28 an hour in order to afford a two-bedroom rental unit. Uh, her wage would work well in Puerto Rico here, but <laughs> that's that's one area. In Hawaii, you need a minimum wage of $31.54 in order to rent a two-bedroom house. In California, you need a wage of $26.04. So the takeaway is that Hillary Clinton's $12 minimum wage is laughable. I mean, anything less than $15 per hour is terrible. So she's going to go through these negotiations with Republicans and they may say, look, Hillary, I get that you want to raise the minimum wage, but we're not going to negotiate at all unless you drop that down to $10. And then, so we're going to get duped there. It's going to drop by $2. And then some Democrats might say, you know what? I'm almost on board, but I'm, a, I'm still a little bit more conservative than my uh, progressive colleagues here, so I'm not going to budge unless that minimum wage hike, it, it's not going to be no more than nine fifty. That's not going to work. <laughs> if, you're, if you're shorting yourself while you're going into negotiations, you're going to have a problem and you're not going to come out on top. So you need to start at this point, I think, at $20. No less than $20, but still, $15. If you go less than that, you're just not being serious and you're setting yourself up to fail and not really do anything for the American people. So we've got to raise the wage. We've got to attach it to inflation. And we've actually got to get serious about ending poverty and ending income inequality. If we actually really want to help poor people and raise the purchasing power of the American people, we've got to start talking about a $25 minimum wage in some counties. Otherwise, people aren't going to be able to get by. Do you guys remember when Donald Trump said this? I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I don't need anybody's money. I'm using my own money. I'm not using the lobbyists. I'm not using donors. I don't care. 
I'm really rich. I had yesterday a lobbyist call me up. It's a friend of mine, good guy. He said, Donald, I want to put $5 million into your campaign. I said, I don't need it. I don't want it. He said, no, no, I want to put $5 million in. I said, I don't want it. I don't want their money. I turned the money down. I turned down so much money. I feel like such a stupid person. Well, it turns out that was a big fat lie. So according to Politico, Trump's campaign uh, actually courted a ton of billionaire donors such as Paul Singer, Sheldon Adelson, and none other than the infamous Koch brothers. So Politico explains Trump's courtship of Adelson, a Las Vegas casino mogul and ardent Zionist involved a very clear ask for money, said a source close to Adelson, who noted the request came even as Trump was publicly declaring that he didn't need donors' money. Trump personally called Adelson and had his staff attempt to set up a meeting in Vegas. Now, Sheldon Adelson actually decided to back out and is now considering supporting uh, Marco Rubio, as we all know. But Trump didn't like that Adelson is going to be supporting Rubio over him and actually tweeted this out. Sheldon Adelson is looking to give big dollars to Rubio because he feels he can mold him into his perfect little puppet. I agree. <laughs> so... Now, Trump also tried to meet with Paul Singer in March, but Singer also declared his support for Rubio, and in the end, here's what Trump had to say about Singer as well. Paul Singer, take a look at what he represents, and he represents other things. Beside, Paul Singer represents amnesty, and he represents illegal immigration pouring into the country, and now he's with Rubio. Alright, so we're kind of seeing a pattern here, but let's continue. So when it comes to the Koch brothers, Politico explains, Trump's aides detailed his policy positions for the Kochs and their donors in a survey put together by Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, the group that coordinates its Koch network and hosts its twice a year donor gatherings. But when Trump was not among the five candidates invited to the Koch donor gathering in August, at which the survey was distributed to donors, he unleashed some serious snark at his rivals who were included. Rubio, Walker, Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, and Carly Fiorina. I wish good luck to all of the Republican candidates that traveled to California to beg for money, etc. from the Koch brothers. Puppets? He tweeted. Now he also tweeted about the Koch brothers. Koch is looking for a new puppet after Governor Walker and Jeb Bush cratered. He now likes Rubio. Next fail. <laughs> so, the hypocrisy is evident. I mean, that's just, he's wearing it on his sleeve. So, it's not really the case that he's railing against money and politics because he's really a principled person and is taking a strong, genuine stance against it, well, what we're seeing here is Donald Trump is butthurt because all of these billionaire donors don't like him and they are backing the establishment candidates. So it's very clear that that's why he's speaking out against candidates. It's not because, you know, he's, he's willing to fight and stand up against crony capitalism and corruption. It's because... They don't want to let him in on the fun. See, he wants to be corrupt himself. He admitted it. He stated that he donated to politicians and they did everything that he wanted them to do. He donated to Hillary Clinton and she came to his wedding, etc., etc. So he's so mad that he's not part of this corrupt circle that now he's railing against it. So I absolutely love this. Look, kudos to Donald Trump. I'm still going to give credit where credit is due because I like that he's railing against big money because it's certainly resonating with Republicans and anything that will encourage people to start talking about getting money out of politics is a win for me but i just think it's funny because this is incredibly hypocritical so donald trump when you say that you're not taking big money because you don't want it we all know you're lying why the fuck you lying why, why you always lying why? oh my god stop fucking lying Bernie Sanders recently introduced two new pieces of legislation that are very progressive. The first one would end the federal ban on marijuana, and the other would prohibit new leases for fossil fuel extraction on public lands. So uh, I'll talk about the weed one first. So when it comes to ending the federal ban on marijuana, well, the Ending Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act of 2015 would abolish all legal penalties for either possessing or growing marijuana. Uh, it would be removed entirely also from the Controlled Substances Act. So currently, if you don't know, marijuana is now a Schedule 1 drug right alongside heroin. And what that means is that it's highly dangerous, it's highly addictive, and it has no medical value. So this would change that. So now the best part is that if this were to pass and we get a Republican president, such as Chris Christie, who says that he's going to enforce the federal bans on marijuana, well then... His hands are tied. He can't do that. So the states that actually want to legalize marijuana, they are completely free to do so. So 
this is fantastic. I mean, it's a step in the right direction. Republicans always talk about states' rights, states' rights, states' rights, states' rights. Well, put your money where your mouth is. This is a states' rights issue, right? So go ahead and let the states legalize it if they want to legalize it. We shouldn't have to worry about Oregon, Colorado, Washington, and Alaska getting their weed taken away if we get a Republican president. That shouldn't be the case. So this is great. So now when it comes to climate change, uh, the bill that he revealed would, according to Raw Story, halt new leases for fossil fuel extraction on public lands and for offshore drilling in the Pacific and Gulf of Mexico. He would prohibit drilling in the Arctic and Atlantic Ocean. So that's fantastic. We, we are destroying our planet. Like, I'm, I'm not laughing because I think that's funny. I'm laughing because it's just crazy that we're allowing this to continue on. We're destroying the planet, and this would kind of halt that progress. I mean, it's not the end-all answer to climate change, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. I mean, even if we take baby steps, I'll be satisfied because we've got to do something, and at this point, we've done nothing. So these are both really great progressive policies. Um, do they have a chance of passing? No, <laughs> they have no chance of passing unless Democrats win maybe at least the Senate, <laughs> but hopefully the House as well. But I mean, we've we've got some politicians that are very secure in their seats that have been gerrymandered. So I don't know if they're going to win back the House, but if we can get more Democrats into Congress, hopefully these actually have a shot of passing. Uh, but even if they won't get passed anytime soon, they still have great symbolic value. It shows that Bernie Sanders is a true progressive uh, he can kind of claim these as his own policies if they ever do get passed. So I think this is great. Um, kudos to Bernie Sanders. So because of these two bills, he earned himself a slow clap. So do you guys remember last week when I told you about how Hillary Clinton is trying to smear Bernie Sanders by calling him a sexist? Well... She's back at it again, guys, and now, can you guys guess what she's doing to smear Bernie Sanders? That's right, she is now accusing him of racism. I'm not kidding. So, at the NAACP meeting in Charleston, South Carolina, she said, quote, There are some who say that this is an urban problem, and she's referring to gun violence. Sometimes what they mean by that is, it's a black problem, but it's not. It's not black, it's not urban, it's a deep, profound challenge to who we are. So basically what she's implying is that when Bernie Sanders talks about the differences between urban and rural communities, well, he's not talking about urban cities and developed cities and whatnot, he's talking about the urban culture. He's talking about black people. They're the ones who are perpetuating all this gun violence. Well, Hillary Clinton knows damn well that that's not what Bernie Sanders is talking about. He's talking about the cultural differences when it comes to gun policy preferences among urban cities and more rural communities. But I come from a rural state, and the views on gun control in rural states are different than in urban states, whether we like it or not. And what he's saying is not wrong. I mean, there's a lot of differences between urban cities and rural areas. So to try to smear him and state that he is talking about black culture and that it's their problem, I mean, geez, I, I, it actually leaves me, leaves me speechless in a way because the ignorance here is just insane. I also love the irony here because this is coming from an individual who endorsed Bill Clinton, her husband's policies. He was really tough on crime, and that led to mass incarceration of African Americans and Latinos. She thought that was a great policy, and only now she's starting to think, mm, Maybe I'm not a, I'm not in favor of that anymore because it's going to hurt my campaign. And furthermore, she praised her husband's welfare reform, and we all know that that was Republican welfare reform. Bill Clinton allowed Republicans to gut welfare, and who did that hurt? That disproportionately impacted African Americans and Latinos. Actually, in, in particular, African American women, because African American single mothers, well, they couldn't get the welfare benefits that they needed because of Bill Clinton. So let's not forget about that aspect. So Hillary Clinton is basically running a downright terrible, deplorable, morally unjustifiable campaign. And I believe the last time I saw something of this nature was back in 2008 when she ran the same type of campaign against Barack Obama. Here's why I don't think this is going to help her, and I think this is going to be terrible for her. So this might help her get through the Democratic primary, maybe by calling Bernie Sanders a sexist and a racist. Well, perhaps that resonates among some of your followers who are just mindless drones and don't even critique you. They just like you because your last name is Clinton. Well, that's fine and dandy, but 
I've got news for you, Hillary Clinton. When you get to the general election, what you've done to get there is you've basically rubbed dirt in the faces of perhaps 40% of the Democratic electorate. I'm talking about progressives. I'm talking about Bernie Sanders supporters. So you're expecting that once you've completely pissed off every single Bernie Sanders supporter, that we're going to support you in the national election? <laughs> you're delusional. I mean, look, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to and seen saying that if it is Hillary Clinton that becomes the Democratic nominee, they're either going to abstain, they're writing in Jill, or they're voting for Jill Stein, or they're writing in Bernie Sanders. Now, I disagree with that. I still plan to vote Democrat no matter what, only because I'm so terrified at the prospect of a Republican winning the White House. But Hillary Clinton is making it even more and more difficult than it already is to cast a vote for her. And <laughs> the fact that she thinks that she can win this way and then go on and ask for our votes when she gets to the general, if that is the case, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. You've now become a liability to the Democratic Party because you've pissed off half of the Democratic electorate and now they're not going to want to vote for you. They may not vote Republican, but do you think that they're going to be excited to vote for you after you accused Bernie Sanders of sexism and racism and you just smeared him at every chance you got when he defended you against your email scandal? Uh, I don't get it. She's not thinking clearly. Is she going to accuse him of being homophobic next week? I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go, Hillary Clinton, because anytime you accuse him and try to smear him, I'm going to come out and refute it because you know it's not true. I know it's not true. People who are smart and have a brain know it's not true because you know what he's saying. We all know what Bernie Sanders is saying, but you're trying to misinterpret what he's saying so that way you can maybe prime people into thinking that he's racially insensitive, maybe even racist because he's an old white man. But the truth is, Bernie Sanders is a civil rights activist, okay? He has the strongest criminal justice reform platform out of anyone. So if you think Hillary Clinton is going to be better on race issues than Bernie Sanders, that's just funny. So according to a plethora of new polls, Hillary Clinton is surging in both Iowa and now New Hampshire. But the question, rather, is can we actually trust these polls? And if you are kind of wondering whether or not we can accurately gauge who's leading and who's more likely to win in either Iowa and, and, uh, or New Hampshire from these polls, the answer is a resounding no, we can't trust them. Uh, and that's because a lot of these polls, unfortunately, are not representative of the general public. They exclude millennials. I mean, in one poll from Monmouth, they actually keep out people that's under 25 because their requirement of who is likely to vote, well, that individual would have had to have participated in the last two elections. Well, if you're just turning 18 and you're excited to vote for Bernie Sanders, you're not going to be uh, have that record of participating in the last two elections. If you include millennials in this poll, well, it's probably the case that Bernie Sanders is doing a lot better. Now, I noticed something uh, kind of interesting about this. So I wanted... Uh, I wanted to, one, develop a call to action based on what I've noticed, and two, uh, kind of discuss some criticism that Bernie Sanders supporters have been getting. So, on David Pakman's show, he covered the Monmouth poll, and he got a ton of criticism from his viewers because of this representability problem. Uh, now, I think that that criticism was actually unfair, and I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. Now, furthermore, whenever I cover polls, uh, to where uh, Bernie Sanders isn't doing too well. I noticed that I'll also get some criticism as well. Uh, so one thing that the anti-Bernie Sanders Democrats are doing is they're stating that, look, these Bernie Sanders supporters, they only like it when you report on polls where Bernie Sanders is doing good. But if they don't like the poll, then they're going to challenge the methodology. When that's not really the case, because as Bernie Sanders supporters, I think that we are right to break out our tinfoil hats once in a while because we all know very well that the establishment is trying to destroy Bernie Sanders' campaign. But here's what I want to do. I want these polls to be a call to action for us Bernie Sanders supporters. So here's my argument. Now hear me out. I think that there is still some valuable information out of all of these polls, including the Monmouth poll, wherein people under 25 weren't polled. So what we can still extrapolate from these polls is that, well, if one poll, for example, it only includes people polled on landlines, well, then we can ascertain from that that people with landlines are probably going to be older. So it's probably the older Democrats. Now, if it is the case that these people are not polling well, 
uh, or, or if it's the case that Bernie Sanders isn't polling well among these demographics, then I don't think we should waste our time critiquing the methodology of the poll because we all know it's flawed. What we should be doing is targeting those demographics. So if, for example, we have this really skewed poll that only includes older demographics, older Democrats, well, then what we can take from that is that not that, you know, we need to challenge the poll because we're worried about sensationalism, but we need to use that information to our advantage. Now, what I'm saying is that we go for those people. We convert them. So, for example, it is the case right now that Bernie Sanders, it, he may be losing his lead in New Hampshire based on the people who are being polled. So what we should do then is we go crazy in New Hampshire. We target New Hampshire because that's a place that we can actually win. So this is a call to action because what we're going to do is we're going to flip the narrative. If a poll shows that Bernie Sanders isn't doing well, we're going to look at the methodology. We're going to look at the demographics polled. And then we're going to go from there. We're going to use this to our advantage. So first and foremost, you got to sign up to volunteer at BernieSanders.com. Uh, there's a ton of things you can do. You can make calls for him and whatnot. He has thousands and thousands of volunteers. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is we can really try to target New Hampshire. Now, I'm not sure how to do this, so I'm hoping that some of my viewers can kind of help me out with this. But we basically share information about Bernie Sanders' campaign in New Hampshire. Now, if you live in New Hampshire, if you live in Iowa, you've got a lot more work to do if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter. But for those of us who are not living in those two states, well, what we can do is we can maybe find senior citizen-oriented pages or groups on Facebook or throughout the Internet and uh, if they are Democratic, we can try to convince them into voting for Bernie Sanders. Now, basically, this is my call to action specifically. I want all of Bernie Sanders' supporters to try to convert one person. Now, I'm not talking about a Republican. Don't waste your time trying to convert a Republican because you're not going to convince them. I, I, I mean, if you can, kudos to you. But I'm saying we need to be as resourceful as possible because we've still got time to flip this. We can still do this. So if you can take one older Democrat that you know who's currently supporting Hillary Clinton and you can flip that individual and convince them to support Bernie Sanders, and if every single one of us does that, think of the impact that that will have. So what this means is that we have some conversations with people. We don't just, you know, uh, bombard people on the Internet. I mean, really have a real conversation with someone. If you see someone who's a Hillary Clinton supporter... Maybe send them a message on Facebook and ask them, hey, I, I noticed that you're a Hillary Clinton supporter. Can you tell me which policies you agree with? And then you can say, well, that's fantastic. Here's why I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. And just being respectful, being polite, and having a general, genuine conversation with these people can convert them. Because think about this. It's not the case that people are supporting Hillary Clinton because they trust her or they agree with her policies. They're doing it for pragmatic purposes. I've talked to a lot of these people. They think that if they vote for Hillary Clinton, well, this is going to uh, give Democrats a better chance of winning in the 2016 election. Us Sanders supporters know that's not true because we look at polls and we see that all of Bernie Sanders' policies, well, they're right in line with the American people, whereas that's not really the case with Hillary Clinton. And for anything that she's claiming to be progressive on, we know she's just doing that because it's politically expedient. So if we can just have conversations, if all of us can convert one person, think of the impact that would have. I mean, look, thus far, Bernie Sanders is sitting at, what, 35, 40 percent support, perhaps even more, because we don't know, because these polls aren't representative, so we can't accurately gauge where he's at. But if for some if in some way all of us flip one person well then that number will double he'll now be polling at 60% as opposed to just 30 or 35 or 40%. So we've really got to use these polls to our advantage guys. And anytime you see a poll take it with a grain of salt but really look at the methodology because I think there's still some useful information there. It's telling us that Bernie Sanders is not doing well among certain types of demographics. So we've got to change this. So this is my call to action. Convert one person, have conversations, be respectful. We don't want people to seem as though we're trolling. We don't want to look like Ron Paul supporters. We, we're we on the right side of history here, guys. So I think that we have the advantage here. We can really convert a lot of people if we just have some genuine conversations. And if for whatever reason you can't convert them, 
move on, go to the next person, talk to a lot of people. And the more people you talk to, the chances are that you could do very well. If you're in New Hampshire, I mean, start knocking on some doors. But I mean, even in your own home state, if you can talk to some people, that'd be great. If you go to BernieSanders.com, he now has a kit for grassroots people. He, You can buy for $25 a ton of pamphlets with Bernie Sanders information as well as some Bernie Sanders stickers. So this is a fantastic way to actually speak to people and then give them some information about the campaign. We've got to start moving, guys, because... I know you guys, some of you actually do trust the polls, and you may be a little bit disheartened by what you're seeing, but let's not get disheartened. Again, we've got a lot of time. All we need to do is win either Iowa or New Hampshire, and we could flip the script. The whole narrative will change. This is what happened in 2007. Nobody thought Obama could win, but then he won one of those two early primary states, and then all of a sudden, he was a real contender. So let's do this. One person, every Bernie Sanders supporter, do your best. As you all know, Ohio just defeated a measure that would have legalized marijuana. Now, Bill O'Reilly went on Fox News, and uh, he decided to gloat about it, but he said a bunch of just stupid things. So I wanted to go ahead and uh, talk about his reaction. So take it away, Bill. The fact tip of the day. Ohio says no to pot, and it was by a landslide. Now, what he's not talking about is any of the details of why they said no to pot it was by a landslide because even uh even though it would have legalized marijuana even the advocates and proponents of legalizing marijuana were against this because what it did was basically set up a monopoly so it's not just black and white yes or no vote it's because well even the proponents had some issues with this bill i'll let them continue Yesterday's vote on legalization, 64% against, just 36% in favor. So Ohio joins Florida and Arkansas in the recent no's against legalizing medical marijuana. Okay, again, he's really simplifying this. He's trying to dichotomize this to a yes or no vote, but there's more nuance to it than that. If you look at Florida, actually, well, 57% voted in favor of legalizing marijuana, but the problem was that it failed because it would have amended the Constitution, which they need to do to legalize marijuana. So they actually needed a supermajority of 60%. So it did fail in Florida, he's correct. But what he's not telling you is that it got a majority of Floridian voters, 57%. I think that most Floridians are in favor of marijuana. So again, he's really trying to make it appear as though more people hate marijuana than not. But it's not the case. I mean, 58% of the country is now in favor of legalized weed. I'll let him continue. Alaska, Colorado, Washington State, and Oregon have said yes. Now, I think it's a cultural thing. Eh, gonna stop him right there. It's not a cultural thing at all. What it is, is a generational thing. See, people like Bill O'Reilly, well, him and his viewers don't like it because they're older. If you look at public opinion polls, you'll see that younger generations are much more in favor of pot uh, than older generations. So it's not the case that it is a cultural thing. It's completely a generational thing. Now, the reason why it's still difficult to get this passed, even though millennials want to legalize marijuana, is because, well, older people vote more often than younger people. So they're going to come out in droves to vote for this, and maybe pot will mobilize a few extra thousand uh, millennials. So the problem is that, you know, we don't vote as much as older people. So again, it's not cultural. It's completely generational. In the South and Midwest, traditional values are held in more esteem. Drug use is considered to be bad, generally speaking. Out West is a more libertine attitude. So here's the factor tip of the day. The more sobriety there is in any society, the stronger that society will be. Right. So I'm sure that right after he's done filming, he's going to go and have a beer, right? <laughs> See, because sobriety is fine uh, for Bill O'Reilly when it's the substances that he doesn't like. So when it's pot, when it's other types of drugs, such as LSD and opiates, whatever, he doesn't like those. But see, it's perfectly okay to not be sober if you're drinking alcohol, right? I think that he probably goes out and has drinks all the time. I, I, I don't think anyone's calling the legality of alcohol into question when it's a drug that is more harmful than marijuana. So the hypocrisy is frustrating to me. And furthermore, I hate this puritanical attitude that he has. I don't smoke pot, so I'm better than you. Now, look, as an individual, I, I don't smoke pot. But now, of course, I've tried it like everyone. Uh, but I, I don't smoke it very often uh, just because it's my preference. But I'm not going to try to stop other people from doing it just because I don't like it. I mean, 
it, it doesn't make any sense for me to do that because when somebody smokes pot, that doesn't affect me at all. Uh, in fact, the only way it affects me is if, you know, someone I know ate my bag of Cheetos because they got super high. Then I'm going to get mad. But <laughs> other than that, you know, it, it doesn't matter. So Bill O'Reilly, he's such a hypocrite because he's all about freedom and small government when it suits his narrative. So Bill O'Reilly is doing what everyone suspected he would. He would gloat over <laughs> the defeat of marijuana in, in, in Ohio. But look, man, times are changing and... This may be a loss right now, but in the future, it's going to be legal in all 50 states. At a Hillary Clinton event at Atlanta University Center, well, her rally was disrupted by Black Lives Matter. Go ahead and take a look. So here's why I like this. I like this because Hillary Clinton is now finally forced to answer for the policies that she endorsed that were very harmful to African Americans. If you look at Bill Clinton's policies on crime, I mean, he basically started this whole mass incarceration thing that led to a ton of African Americans and Latinos being locked up. If you look at his welfare reform, well, you'll see that that really affected African Americans more so than other people, and it disproportionately impacted single African-American moms because he made it more difficult for them to get welfare. He signed Republican welfare reform, which basically just gutted welfare and made it more difficult for people to get welfare and more difficult for them to qualify for welfare. So the biggest thing that irritated me is that she hasn't had to answer for any of this. And furthermore, she kind of got away scot-free while Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley, well, they got disrupted by Black Lives Matter. And I agree with that because look at what happened. Both of them released racial, racial justice platforms. Now, Bernie Sanders was already in favor of it. He already spoke out about those issues, but he just became that much more stronger. He made a centerpiece of his campaign. While Hillary Clinton, how often does she mention Black Lives Matter? Now, when Black Lives Matter spoke with her before, she really didn't indicate any strong policies. But look, if these politicians aren't going to listen, listen, you've got to make them listen. You've got to yell. You've got to scream. You've got to make your voice heard because right now... Black Lives Matter is representing a cause that is very important. I mean, the situation is urgent. I mean, we can't keep going on like this. It can't be the case that African-American citizens are afraid to leave their house because they're afraid of being assaulted or even worse, killed by a police officer. Hillary Clinton has got to put forth policy to address this. And finally, I think that this could potentially help with that. Now, the thing that's very ironic to me is that I don't know if you could tell by her podium, but it says, quote, we're fighting for, or she's fighting for us. Now, what happened? They came there. They yelled Black Lives Matter. They tried to get her to listen. And what happened? They were escorted out. That's right. That's the headline that you see. See, Bernie Sanders listened to them when he was disrupted by Black Lives Matter. And he even let them speak. Hillary Clinton, well, she kicked him out. Now, the part that's, that's kind of hurtful to me is that they were kicked out by African-American security guards and Representative John Lewis was there, who's a civil rights legend. I mean, he did disruptive protests, and they were kicked out. He didn't stop it. Dude, you, you're doing the same. You were doing the same thing that they're doing. You were very disruptive. How can you allow them to be kicked out when she's not addressing their concerns? She was stating, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. No, Hillary Clinton, you talk about that right now because we've waited long enough to hear what you're going to do. So I absolutely like that they disrupted her campaign. Uh, I think that it's good. I want every single candidate to come out with a strong criminal justice reform program. And she hasn't done that yet. So I think that until she does, they should continue to protest her events. Well, that's the end of the episode. I want to thank all you guys for tuning in. I want to welcome all my newest subscribers. And let's get out there and convert one person and make them vote for Bernie Sanders if we can do this. Let's have lots of conversations. I'll see you guys next week.